have you guys ever made a promise to God before? I know that I, I've done that a lot of times, and it's weird that I remember this one specific instance, but I do. I was at my cousin's house who we all lived really in close proximity to each other, so we were all best friends growing up, and I remember being at their house late one night, uh, and, and my mom was, you know, trying to get us to, to go. It was time for bed, um, and, and I just, we were having so much fun. I wanted to stay there. I wanted to just spend the night, sleep over that night, uh, and then, you know, we just live a couple minutes away. Mom, just come pick me up tomorrow morning. We don't have school tomorrow. It's no big deal. You know, it's summertime, and it's weird that I can remember this because it's not anything special, really, but I remember, like, as I was walking down their steps, just descending into the living room before I asked my mom if I could just stay and sleep over. I remember saying to God in my head, I remember going, all right, God, if you let mom say yes, I'll never ask you for this again. I'll never bother you about this again. Just this one time, please, God, please. You know, I, I, I don't know if y'all have ever done something like that, but I, I did it then. And, and kids do it with parents all the time too, right? Like, like if you let me have this toy, I will never disobey you again, right? You're, at, you're getting ready to, to check out at, at Target or Walmart or the grocery store, and they're looking at the candy, and you're like, what promise are they going to make me now to get me to buy them a Snickers or something, right? And I think for us, it can be tempting to do that with God a lot of times. If I do this for you, God, then will you please do this for me? Or, or maybe it's, it's the other way around. If you do blank, fill in the blank, whatever it is, for me, God, then I'll do this for you. We're making these conditional promises to, to God, right? God, if I'll do this for you, then will you please do this for me? Or, or if you do whatever it is, God, for me, then in turn, when, when you've given me whatever I asked you, then I'll do this. I'll obey you. I'll go to church. If you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, right? And it's a really easy trap to fall into, but that's not how God works, uh, luckily for us, actually. I know it seems no big deal. Everybody does it, right? But it's, that's not how God works, and that's a good thing. And, and so here's what our defining sentence is going to be for our session today as we get to, this is the second to last session of Psalm 119. Sad to be leaving you guys next week. Uh, but here's going to be our defining sentence for this week. Even though it may not seem like it at first, I promise it's good news for us. You ready? The foundation of our thriving is found outside of our own efforts. The foundation of our thriving is found outside of our own efforts. So let's be honest, because a ton of our video series, the, the, the sessions that we've been doing over the past nine weeks, they've been about our, our life, just a lot about our life. It's been very practical. It's, it's sort of like self-help, life advice type stuff. If you want to thrive, then do this. That's kind of what, what we've been operating under, right? That's what I've been teaching out of Psalm 119. We've been going through it. If you want to thrive, then do this or don't do this. It's like a cooking show almost, right? It, it could seem like that. I, I don't know if y'all have ever watched a cooking show like this. Or, or maybe you're, you're looking up a recipe even. It doesn't have to be a cooking show. And you look at, at how to make this dish, how to make these really good looking cookies, or how to make this, this chicken pie. And, and you're looking at it and, and you just see the video and everybody's, you know, they've got all these ingredients laid out. And, and you, you watch it and it looks great, it looks easy. But then when you actually do it, it's not as easy as they made it look, right? You, they, they say you, you pour in this, a cup of this, and a tablespoon of that. You need a little bit of butter here, a little, you know, this, that, and the other. And you think, all right, I, I'm going to put all the ingredients in just like they showed it to me. But somehow it didn't turn out quite as yummy or it didn't look as good as you thought it was going to be, right? Or maybe it was just a complete disaster. It's like, I followed everything that they told me to do, right? And yet it still didn't that food still wasn't right. Here's what I want to avoid with this 10th session. We're almost done, and I want to avoid the cooking show trap. I don't want you guys to have watched these videos for 11 weeks in a row, and when you get to the end, you say to yourselves, okay, God, I, I'm going to do everything that the pastor tells me to do, and then you will make my life thrive, right? I'm going to live as blameless as 
as I possibly can, I, just like we talked about in session one, um, then you're going to make my life thrive. I'm going to build my life on the foundation of God's Word. We talked about that every week. I'm going to try to get perspective in my life, to see my situations differently, like we talked about a few weeks ago. I'm going to put my hope in God's Word. I'm going to trust the Bible. I'm going to try and have a biblical worldview that we talked about not too long ago. I'm going to put all these ingredients in and just dump them in into my life. Then I'm going to put them in the oven on 350 for six months, and all of a sudden, boom. God blesses my life, and I start to thrive. And I want us to avoid that trap because that's not how life works. And that's not how God works. So check out our passages in Psalm 119 today, and we're going to see David kind of teeter back and forth with this same idea, but eventually God presents his truth and he inserts it into David's life. And I think it's going to be really helpful for us to look at. So check out Psalm 119, verse 145 through 147. That's what we're going to be reading for this first part here. 145 starts, With my whole heart I cry. Answer me, O Lord. I will keep your statutes. I call to you. Save me that I may observe your testimonies. I rise before dawn and I cry for help. I hope in your words. My eyes are awake before the watches of the night that I may meditate on your promise. So you see what I was saying? That David sort of does this idea that we just talked about. David seems to struggle with those same things that we, that we just mentioned about the cooking show and about making promises to God, right? God, if you save me, if you answer my prayer, if you, if you get me out of this hard situation, I will obey you. I will keep your statutes. It looks like David is in the midst of, of messing this up, right? But verse 147 that we read there at the end, it helps us interpret 145 to 146 a little bit better. Look at 147. It says, I hope in your words. We thought that he was hoping in his own efforts, right? You, you, if you look at 145 and 146, you're thinking, oh, he's going to do all these things and then God's going to act on his behalf. He, he's trusting in what he can do for God. He messed it up, right? But no, 147 kind of reverses that. And even the rest of the verses in the stanza that, that we're not going to read, but if you, if you look at those, you can see, oh, now I see where his true hope is for his help, right? We see where he's putting that hope. He says, I put my hope in your word. Verse 148, I, I'm staying up during the night and I'm meditating on your word. Verse 152 says it, that I know that your word is going to last forever. My efforts are not going to last forever. I can't even keep a New Year's resolution, much less obey God perfectly. So I put my hope for a life that thrives on God, not on me, right? We, we, we know that we fail. We know that we are imperfect. So we're going to put our hope for a life that thrives, a life that we want. We're going to put that on God and not on our own efforts. Let me ask you guys this question um, as we close this first part of our session today. What are you hoping in? After this series is over, you're, you're, you're hoping your life will thrive because of what you do and what you put into practice. Is that what your hope is in? What, what, what you're going to do when this is over? Or are you hoping that your life will thrive based on the goodness of God? We can do all the things that I've taught over the past 10 weeks. Like you and I, we can get in this together. It's like, all right, this is what I've been saying for literally 10 weeks in a row. going to do it all. But it's not our efforts that make our life thrive. Those things might help. But if you're reading this psalm with me, you, you've noticed that David consistently and constantly, he's asking for help because his life is a wreck. His life is not some easy, perfect existence like, like we might think or, or expect from, from someone who is called a man after God's own heart. I mean, the guy that, that wrote this is proof that even if we do all the right things, even if all the ingredients are correct, it may not turn out like we had hoped. And so that's why we, we have to put our hope and our hope for this life that thrives outside of our own efforts. Let's talk these things over, um, and then, then when we come back, I'll, I'll show you guys some more good news about this idea of thriving not being based on our own efforts. So here's the questions for the first part.
Okay, I hope you guys had a fruitful time considering those questions that, that we just thought through. Let's go back to Psalm 119 and look at our second stanza for the second half of our session today. Before we start reading, let me preempt uh, this by saying this. We're going to see a pattern emerge in these eight verses. And so here's how I'm going to show you what the Holy Spirit is communicating through David in this psalm. I'm going to read verse 154, then I'm going to read verse 156, and then I'm going to read verse 159. And so see if you notice any similarities in there. Um, and, and I think that's going to help us understand what's going on here. Here's 154, 156, and 159. I plead my cause and redeem me. Give me life according to your promise. Great is your mercy, O Lord. Give me life according to your rules. Consider how I love your precepts. Give me life according to your steadfast love. Did you catch it? David, in, in these three verses that I just read, he's repeating the same word at, at the last part of each verse. What, what it's translated in, in English that I read was, give me life. And, and that translation is really just one Hebrew word. Um, it's not three Hebrew words like it is in English. It's just one Hebrew word that we translate that way. It could mean revive or, or, or preserve life or breathe life. See, David, he's asking God here to revive him. To like give him that life that we read. To breathe life into him. And here's what I want you to notice about this pattern. We're not going to read these, but check out the verses immediately preceding the ones that we just read. So that would be verse 153, 155, 157, and 158. Just, just look at those. Just look at them for a second. See if you notice a pattern. You see in 153, 155, 157, 158, it's bad, right? It, he, what David's doing here is he's creating a pattern. It, it's like a, there, there's a bad verse followed by a good verse. Bad verse followed by a good verse. And then 57 and, and 58 are, are two bad verses right in a row before 159. It, it says in 55, the, the quote, the bad would be affliction. But then the next verse, give me life. And then, and then in 155 and 156, or 155 and 157, you see things like, the wicked are not obeying your laws. And then the next verse, give me life. Many are my enemies. Then the next verse, give me life. And each of those, those give me life, each of those reviving, each of those breathe life into me, it's according to something, right? It's according to God's word and his steadfast love, right? Each one of those, it says, give me life according to your promise. Give me life according to your rules. And give me life according to your steadfast love. Verse 154 and 156 say, give me life according to your word. 159, give me life according to your faithful love, your steadfast love. Love. See, it's not about David's abilities at all. He knows that he needs help. He is tired. He is restless. He's, he's stressed out. He's anxious because of what's going on around him. And so he asks God to revive him according to God's merits and God's goodness. God's promises. God's word. God's love. God's faithfulness. He's not basing his ask on his own good deeds or his own faithfulness or, or anything that he can do for God, right? We see that in there. He's saying, God, I need you to act because of who you are, not because of who I am or anything that I can do or that I don't do or any of my obedience. God, I need it to be based off of you and who you are. See, David realizes that the foundation for thriving is found outside of his own efforts. And Christians, we, we know that to be true, right? But whether or not we believe it and, and, and live it out, it's it, sometimes a different story, right? We know as Christians that, that our salvation, that our forgiveness, it, it's not won by our own merits or anything good that we can do. But instead, it's a gift from God by grace through faith. We know that. When you become a Christian, that's what you profess to believe. So if you're a Christian, you, you believe that. But we don't often live it out like that, right? Because I think what often happens, though, is, is after we make that profession, that initial profession of faith, we, we say, thanks for your help, God, for getting me out of hell and into heaven. Now let me try to earn your love, <laughs> right? 
Let me try to earn your grace. Let me try to earn your blessing. Let me try to earn your favor. See, if I go to church every week, God, will you bless me then? If I volunteer at church, what if I I join in our group? What if I watch the videos on the website every week? I don't miss a week. Will you please bless me then? What we don't realize is that we're often asking for things that we already have. We often try to earn something that we already own. What I want you guys to hear this session as we wind down really our entire series on on Psalm 119 and, and this life that thrives and talking about that is that you having a life that thrives, it's only ever a blessing from God. It's never something you can earn. It is only ever a blessing from God. You cannot, literally impossible, for anyone on this earth to manufacture, create the blessed life. Because nothing you do or don't do can earn that. If you want to live a life that thrives, do all the things that we've talked about up to this point in this series. Use the notes that you've taken. Do all those things. Those are not bad things. I wouldn't have taught them if if they were bad. Do them. That's great. But know that you can't earn it. That it's not based on your faithfulness or your obedience to the things that I've said. There is no secret formula that we can produce to get God to bless us. Here's our formula for success, for thriving. It's this, it's plain and simple. God's grace through Jesus' work. And don't notice how we're not involved in that formula at all, right? We're just the ones getting fixed. We're just the recipients of it. And so as we close down part two today, be encouraged to know that a life that thrives is found outside of our own efforts, outside of my efforts, outside of your efforts. It is all God's great grace to us on behalf of us. And everything that we do for God is just a response in thankfulness for how good He is to us. So all those things that, we've, that we talked about from, from week like one to nine, it's like we do all of that as a response not trying to earn it. When we live out of a place of blessing, instead of trying to earn that blessing, we can be like David and we can have this life that thrives no matter what circumstance we're up against. Let me say that again because this, I think, is a huge point that is going to need to be nailed home in our lives if we are really going to trust God to help us thrive. It's that this simple idea that when we live out of a place of blessedness, out of a place of blessedness, meaning we're starting there. We know that we're blessed because we're Christians. We know that we're blessed because God has sent his son for us. And when we live out of that place, instead of trying to constantly earn that blessing, then we can be like David and have that life that thrives under any and every circumstance. So I hope this session has been an encouragement to you as you think about how to have the life that thrives and know that it doesn't reside on you and who you are and what you can do, but it resides on who God is and all the things he has done for us. Here's the second part of those questions. 